140 miles south of the border, the little Mexican town of Colonet is cut in two by Baja California's main highway. But few of the people hurrying by are aware that Colonet is the home of a fascinating experiment in creating a sustainable agriculture based on little known food bearing trees. An experiment that has the potential to make a significant contribution to the problem of world hunger. But don't start looking for gleaming laboratories or rows of expensive nursery grown fruit trees. What is happening is much simpler than that, yet more exciting if we have the eyes to see it. For it is an experiment that is within the reach of the very people it is meant to help. Paul Jackson grew up on an Ohio farm and spent his life traveling the world in the Merchant Marine and working as a plant breeder. And along the way, he realized that the world was far from maximum food production, even in those places where hunger was a serious problem. Finally, at an age when most men dream of retirement, Paul decided to live out his dream of food abundance on five acres of sandy, scrub-covered land. Thirteen years later, Paul and his wife Francisca and their niece Selsa and the two youngest members of the family live in a sturdy stone house and are surrounded by a bountiful garden and orchard where Paul carries out his experiments and distributes hundreds of trees and plants to the people in the area. My name is Paul Jackson. We have a little organization called the International Association for Food Self-Sufficiency. We have a growing grounds for the organization here in Colonet in Baja, California. On this growing grounds, as the last count, we had 58 different kinds of trees and shrubs, perennials, that would produce food could be used for the children in the area and elsewhere. Uh, some of these need further development, but most of them are satisfactory the way they, the way they are. The Tahitian squash is an extremely productive, extremely vigorous squash that has virtually no disease problems in this part of the country. And the flavor and uses of it are enormous. No waste. The natal plum, a Carissa grandiflora, comes from South Africa originally. It is, there is one commercial fruiting type of is, uh, available, and we have gotten the seed from it. We now have in the field, right close in the greenhouse, right close to 5,000 plants. We have given away several thousand already. Uh, it is rather erratic in germination, and has, but other than that, it has virtually no problems. It is thorny, it is rather slow growing, but there are plants of it that produce fruit the year round. It has a great big white, fragrant bloom. The fruit sometimes is astringent, but never so much so that the kids won't eat it. It makes a wonderful juice. We named this place Rancho Cherimoya. A good cherimoya is probably as good a fruit as you can find. They are supposed to have a flavor that's like a combination of oranges, uh, pineapple, a uh, touch of lime, and banana. It's a very productive tree once it's grown. Uh, they say they reach its peak production in about 50 years. Starts producing in three to four. The one that has had no work, uh, virtually no work done on it at all, and still quite an interesting fruit is the capuline cherry, the Mexican wild cherry. And when it completely ripe, it is sort of a purple color and rather bland. When taken, all of them in a bunch and cooked together, some of them uh, red and some of them purple, it produces a juice very, very similar to cranapple juice. And it is a very productive, 
uh, starts producing very young in the second year frequently. And in many cases, uh, there are trees that are grown to 80, 90 feet in height. We don't have any that big. But uh, there's another one that has an enormous potential, which we're trying to distribute a lot of. Another real interesting one is the one most of you know of, the guava. We have several different types of guavas. Some of them are very large, a couple of them are very delicious, and it is a fruit almost all Mexicans like very much. It grows easily, starts producing in uh, two or three years from seed, and uh, there are a number of good ones we need to graft onto a lot of seedlings and distribute. It is wonderful for eating fresh. It makes a real good jelly or jam. Uh, they make pie and juice out of it. The common name, depending on where you're at, is wahi, washi, or wachi. It grows very rapidly. It starts producing uh, the pods and beans in the first year sometimes. It has a powder puff type bloom. The Oaxacans uh, eat all, most all the parts of it, the growing tips, the young beans, the flowers, the, the pods, and uh, so forth. Now throughout most of the world, uh, they also use it in what they call alley cropping. In that particular deal, they plant rows of the tree close together and prune it to a height they desire, 10, 12 feet usually. And then they have it probably about 20 feet rows, uh, apart in the rows, and they plant the corn, beans, and other crops in there. Uh, the washi is one of the legumes that produces nitrogen in the soil. Now we're doing some alley farming here, and so far it looks like it's going to be very good. Uh, the dwarf gray sugar, uh, peas, the edible pod, grow about twice as tall alongside a row of washi as they do in a normal condition. I have waited for 16, 17 years for some trees that we got to start producing fruit. This is a white sapote, a sapote blanco. The fruit on it, uh, the ordinary type, is about the size shape and color of Granny Smith apple. It has from one to three or four large seeds in it. The skin when it's ready to eat is very, very tender. And the nearest thing I can call about the flavor of it is a good vanilla custard. Now once they start producing, they produce in enormous quantities. It takes a long time for them to start, from 8 to 18 years. The trees, some of them get very large, uh, some not so good. But the production is good for possibly 100, 150 years. And by the way, the cherimoya would grow for almost the same period of time. And they're a very, in my opinion, a very wonderful fruit. They're not at all well known. This is the macadamia or Queensland nut. There are two main species, and they're now being grown extensively in California. It is a very good nut with an extremely hard shell. There are a number of varieties, some producing heavier than others. Uh, they can produce an enormous number of uh, nuts in one raceme. Each one of these little flowers can make a nut. And uh, the potential for them in Mexico, this part of Mexico, is very, very good. And uh, nuts here are extremely expensive and not so common as it would be in the States. And this is one that could change the picture of it very, very greatly. They bloom pretty near the year around, and the flowers are so aromatic that they smell the whole place up. I would plant them just for the flower, not the nut. But we do have the benefit of the nut and the evergreen foliage. The carob is another plant that produces food that is extremely drought resistant. Once established, they will produce fruit 
the pods during periods of a prolonged drought and in quite large quantities they are the, the kids eat the pods as they come but they do make a powder and make molasses and candy and everything else out of the carob. It does not have the theobromine in that you get in chocolates, therefore it's considered considerably more healthful. We want to distribute a very large number of these in areas where the other trees will not grow, where it's too dry. But the big thing is that we have let people know that we have the trees here. We have not attempted to push them on them. We have slowly waited for them to start coming, and now they're coming in larger numbers. So-and-so said, you go to grow some trees, they'll produce some fruit, and you give them to us. Can we have some? And uh, that way, we think there's a much better chance of them uh, taking a little bit of care of them and of them living. Well, I think it's both sinful and absurd for people to be without food. We have the facilities right now, despite what anybody might tell you differently, are producing two or three times as much food as the people in the world need. As the population increases, it's going to be more of a bind, but it is not right now. Land is not utilized to its full uh, benefit effect right now, uh, to its full potential. Uh, land that people say is, is definitely not. Areas like this grow one crop a year and it's possible to grow continuous crops and still build up the soil. And it makes me very, very upset to see hunger existing. The big thing we'd like to see happen in the future, outside of increasing our ability to produce the trees and all, is to get a whole lot of the different ones that are potentially uh, useful for this type of a climate. And uh, try to make the area as well supplied with food producing trees as possible. The uh, diet of tortillas and beans is sort of limited and they don't eat, have too much meat. It's much more expensive here than it is in the United States. I also am very anxious to find some younger person who will come down and learn a little I know and take over the operation when I'm no longer here, which may be any time. I'm starting to get up in age a little bit. Also, we're interested in volunteers who'd like to come down and stay two weeks, three weeks, whatever and help us with the weeds and the planting and the grafting and the propagating of all the things. We would like to have any of the visitors that have a chance bring us down any size of used pots. We need them very badly. Uh, peat moss, uh, any type of material like that, sponge rock. We do have bunk beds that we can drive, provide for people. We have no problem feeding them. And somebody who wants to come down and spend his life in something like this, he or she, uh, we can provide with a board and room and a little bit of spending money, not much, until they learn to raise the money for themselves and keep things going.